Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome on behalf of Northern Ireland's six further and higher education colleges, the Department for the Economy and the Hospitality and Tourism Skills Network, HATS, to the second of four webinars in this Hospitality and Tourism Management Skills Spotlight series. My name is Eden Bryan. I'm very pleased to be here as webinar host today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel shortly and also to advise you at this stage uh, to all of you joining us online. First of all, thank you for joining us. But you as an audience today are encouraged to leave questions in the chat function for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So we'll have three formal presentations. Then each of our panelists will be uh, very happy to answer any questions that you have. And I should also say on behalf of the organizers that there'll be four polls which will be held live during our webinar today. Okay, so we really want to get your opinion, not only in the Q&A, but also we'll be taking your, um, kind of taking the, the temperature of the meeting as well, if I may put it like that, by taking the poll. So I'm just gonna introduce our panelists before we move in to the first of our presentation today. As I said, my name's Eden Brown, I'm Senior Director at Belfast Met. Very pleased indeed to be here today to host this uh, webinar. Our first speaker, we'll hear from uh, our first speaker in just a, a moment, is Nicola Daly, who's Director of Daily Recruitment. You'll hear about uh, Nicola's 20 years of experience as she shares her expertise with us in just a few moments' time. Then we head to one of the world's most successful and popular uh, tourism uh, destinations. Well, not literally, but we had to hear from someone who is the head of human resources at Titanic Belfast. And I'm sure like me, you're very much looking forward to hearing the thoughts of Heather Graham. She contributes invaluable information to you uh, this afternoon. And then the third piece of the jigsaw, and when I was chatting uh, in, in college this week to Margaret McCabe and Donna Comfrey about this, they were very pleased that the organisers wanted to have the third piece of the jigsaw, jigsaw there, the third tr piece of triangular information, which of course is the education perspective. Now, as you know, there are six regional colleges in Northern Ireland, 40 main buildings and 400 out centres. So we're here to help you uh, wherever you are located. Now, as you know, uh, joining us today, the Management Skills Spotlight Series has been created to provide you, the hospitality and tourism sector, employers, managers and leaders with bite-sized learning opportunities directly re relevant to your industry, your role and the work that you undertake every day that impacts on you as a manager and a business leader. Now, this series, the organisers hope, will enable you to build skills, gain knowledge, and share experiences with other managers in hospitality and tourism. Very much the news is of the moment. Uh, announcement being made yesterday, I received an email from the, the Hastings Group advertising very exciting afternoon tea. And I'm sure there'll be a wonderful uh, offer uh, of uh, hospitality um, provision right across the country. So today we're going to draw on the skills and experience of our guest speakers, their industry representatives, as well, of course, as college lecturing staff. I, as you know, when just in the news, I was hearing this yesterday, watching ETV news, other news programs are available. But there was an industry leader talking about what she sees may be a possibility in attracting chefs in the future. And uh, we'll hear about other rules. So as you know, as industry leaders and managers, attracting and retaining staff has always been a key challenge for the hospitality and tourism sector. Now, this has, as you all know better than anyone, been exacerbated further as the result of for well over a year, such a long period. Now, the sector, as you all know, has lost both permanent and cash and staff. With the sector set to reopen, and there are dates in our diaries, and it was a great pleasure for me to hear Michael Dean speaking so powerfully and eloquently in view from Stormont on UTV on Monday night about his ambitions to build back better. So as you know, reopening is on the cards. Many hospitality and tourism businesses are faced with recruiting staff to come back into the sector as they've done other things. Businesses will also need to implement strategies to retain key staff, managers, chefs, leaders uh, through these challenging and uncertain times. As someone who is uniquely placed to share her expertise is our first presenter today. With over 20 years of experience, our speaker uh, is a recruitment specialist with a track record of achievement in the hospitality and tourism sector. She's going to provide in her presentation guidance on how the industry can widen its pool of potential applicants through identifying key soft skills, or as some employers refer to them as key human skills, which are transferable in people who have been working in completely different industries. Uh, Nicola will also focus on how businesses can retain and develop staff through the management pathway or those seeking to explore opportunities across other roles within the business. With her thoughts on this most special day and in this webinar, our first presenter today is the Director of Daily Recruitment, Nicola Daly. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, delighted that so many of you have joined us this afternoon. Um, I can only but say myself that I can't wait to see everyone as the news this week and last week emerged for, for reopening of the industry. Um, it is very exciting. There is a lot of um, fear as well in terms of the spotlight on attracting and retaining staff. So I'm going to have a look at, from my perspective, in terms of working with candidates and my clients, in terms of giving a wee bit of feedback, um, in terms of how we can move forward. At the end of the day, we are an industry. Um, every one of us who work in it are an ambassador for it. And I think it's important that we remember that um, as, as we move forward in terms of in our day-to-day -day -day workplaces, that we remember that everybody is an ambassador ambassador in everything that we do and say and it's important that we all move together um, at the same pace and we all move together with the same mindset to help to attract and retain people within the wonderful sector that it is. Um, I've been in it over 20 years now and certainly if it wasn't a great sector um, I wouldn't have lasted this long and I know many of you are pretty much the same. So that stands by itself to say what a wonderful industry it is. So I'm going to get going and looking at the what my thoughts are in terms of what we should be looking at as we move forward and as you start to move forward to recruit for, for your team. OK, I think the number one thing is everybody has to remember, and I see this so many times, is the reporting of the recruitment process to your brand. Um, I see so many times where, you know, companies are out with great um, marketing in terms of everything else and their the recruitment process when it comes to going out with with job advertisements and whatnot seems to be it doesn't just the two brands just don't seem to to meet. Um, so it's important that we have you have the input of your marketing department behind when you're going out with an advertisement. Also, the advertisement, as if anybody follows me on Twitter, you will see this week that um, I had just said about somebody who was going out with um, entry level roles and asking for two years hospitality experience. You know, everybody has to be realistic in the market that we are in. We are trying to attract and retain people into the industry. Um, and to attract people in, we have to be mindful that not everybody, especially in entry level roles, are going to have that experience. So we have to be open minded, look for transferable skills um, and see in terms of the key thing, as we all know, in hospitality is is personality, people being able to um, work with customers and, and develop. So the one thing, key thing is, I would say, is look at your advertisement. Is your advertisement really saying what you're looking to attract? Are you blocking anybody from um, not applying to that advertisement? Because people at the moment, the confidence is low and people don't want to any, any more rejection. The other thing is, are your expectations too high? Are you in terms of, for instance, in a hotel environment, looking for a front house manager? And I do get this where people would say maybe three to four years experience. People in in that type of environment are looking to, to to progress so to me that's kind of unrealistic in terms of if that's one of your your key areas three to four years because at that point people are looking to move on into progress up the career ladder into into hospitality and and certainly we have to be mindful of that in terms of so look at your advertisement are you restricting anything what you know be open-minded on your advertisement um when it goes out so that you can attract people that you want to attract and bear in mind that be, be open-minded to people coming especially in entry-level roles that you can train and that they have the personality and you can train it on from there Communication with applicants, this is absolutely crucial and this is something I see so many times um, and in terms of keep the, uh, the communication open, even if somebody applies for a job and they don't they don't fit the criteria or something or they maybe you could reach out to them and say, listen, can I keep you don't um, you're not you don't meet the requirements for this role, but can we keep you on file um, to move forward if something else um, maybe comes in? A simple yes or a no means so much, and especially in these times, and will mean so much to a candidate. Um, hearing nothing will put a candidate off from applying again because they haven't received 
any kind of communication and that's also vitally important to your brand because people will be talking as more so now than ever and people will be discussing the recruitment process um so you want your recruitment process to be one of the best and you want people to say well you know they came back to me they're keeping me on file and it's little things like that that are really 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 going to impact and will paint a picture for for your brand and encourage people to work for you an interview setting, this is something that I guess for myself, we, I've been working with and speaking with a lot of my clients over the past number of years on. Um, I think we have to be mindful that hospitality is a hospital um, environment and a number of clients have adjusted the interview setting in terms of maybe as much as taking somebody back to the back of the restaurant or just for a coffee and sitting and having a less informal setting. That way you're letting somebody relax, you're letting the personality come out and you're letting going in and somebody sitting across the table with four or five people. At this moment in time, with confidence, you have to remember confidence when people now are coming out of lockdown. And it's the number one thing that I'm hearing from candidates. Um, that is crucial that you make the person feel comfortable so that you can see the right um, you can see their personality, you can let them breathe, can let them answer the questions in a way that they have prepped for it. And communication to successful and unsuccessful candidates. I have this written into my terms and conditions and my clients will, will, will tell you this. Um, it is vitally important because I believe it's vitally important for the candidate and it's vitally important um, for everyone involved that we understand why the candidate wasn't successful. Um, from a recruiter's point of view, this is good information in terms of this helps me to steer the candidate to where that candidate needs to be. Also, it could be a matter that the candidate did do something, but um, when it came to the interview, it just didn't seem to answer the question correctly or things like that. That also can help the candidate build and prep for moving ahead. And it's important as an industry, we remember that. We're all in this together. We all want to come out of it together. And it's all about helping each other as we move forward. So given that um, communication to successful and successful interviews um, is important and feedback, feedback is just, I have it in terms of conditions that it, for, from the moment a CV goes in, it must have feedback within five days, within an interview five days, and also um, any kind of feedback. And that's crucial because that's me managing my brand, that's me managing my client's brand, and that's me also managing the expectations of the candidate. So that's trying to make the flow happen. And I think that is vitally important and anybody certainly that has, has worked with myself will know um, I'm very much sticking to that because it's, it's crucial in a recruitment process. The impact of bad recruitment process on brand management, it, the figure said itself, um, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, 80% of people say the reputation of a company as employer is important when applying for a job. So we all know hospitality is a small industry. We are all one big family. We Everybody talks, everybody, you know, talks among themselves and there's no point in um, anything different on that. Um, and that will impact, you know, your previous employers talking to um, people who who have worked potentially going to apply for a job, talking to other employees. And I would always do that myself if I take a new client on or I'm not sure. Um, I would do my research too because I also manage my brand um, from that perspective in terms of, you know, there's good employers, there's bad employers, but I have to monitor and represent the best that's in the industry in line with my ethos and where, where my standards are in terms of driving the industry forward. I'm very much about career progression, looking after people and keeping people within in the industry that we all know and love. But the fact that 80% of people are asking um, the choice of employer is it's a huge amount. Um, so you want to be right, you want to get it right, and you want your brand management to be positioned right within the market so that if anything is, that everybody has had that good experience um, from applying for a role with yourself. And the 93% will ask industry will ask industry colleagues. I think that's crucial in itself. It's we all are 
have done it at some stage in terms of we're going for a job we will make a couple of phone calls to see is this the right person is this the right company that i should be working for is it the right culture is it um there's a number of questions that that will be that will be asked um before somebody actually applies for a job and the other thing is which i will crucially say because somebody has applied for a job doesn't necessarily mean that person will take the job um if if it is offered it is a two-way street we are currently sitting in a two-way street now where we all have to work together and something i've seen time and time again is um people leaving a process or somebody who has the exact skills for a role but because it's taken too long the process has taken too long somebody might be sitting in front you might have a candidate sitting in front of you um that candidate's in the market looking for other roles so they might have applied for you they might have applied for three or four different roles we are currently sitting in a situation where people want to get back into work so people want to get back into work so if there's somebody sitting in front of you who you really want on on your books and you really want um on your employment you know act quickly that is my um number one thing that i will say if there is somebody because somebody else is going to snap them up everybody is on the market at the moment um looking good staff and it is it is very much a candidate driven market therefore you know if you take a week five days whatever um that person is going to to have moved on or maybe accepted a role with with, with somebody else and i think that is a crucial thing that um aspect of your recruitment process that i will say if you're going to tell somebody in an interview you'll be back to them on wednesday go make sure you're back to them on wednesday because that person is sitting waiting on wednesday for you to come back if you is a wee bit of a hold up maybe drop them an email and just explain to them something that's cropped we will be back to you as soon as possible we're still in the process keep those communication channels open because that's vitally vitally important and again that also lets if the person is or the candidate is going for another role that they can say to you well this is what the situation is it opens up a conversation and everybody can be transparent in in terms of moving forward um the fallout from companies with the persistent issue in losing top talent um definitely is from from the experience of candidates waiting too long on a recruitment process. So what is the value in investing in good recruitment? Well, um, that's what I do daily and I'm glad to see the phones are back on um, all week with, with roles coming in. So it is a very exciting time. I guess the number one thing is transparency and anybody who has worked with myself will know that I build honest and very open um, relationship with both my clients and candidates. I take everybody on, but they become part of the daily recruitment family as really what, what I would say and constantly keep in contact to see what is happening and, and what is going on. I am known to be very open and honest and I don't believe that it's fair in anybody not to be any other way. And I think especially when it comes to candidates, if a candidate um comes to myself um i very much assess their skills and you know identify i can tell if a client is looking at pacific uh item and the candidate doesn't have it how how we can work forward or what that um candidate can speak to a manager on to develop in that area to get to where they want to be the knowledge well knowledge is a huge thing and i guess if many of you from the industry that would know me would know that I am very much 24 seven within the industry, um, constantly seeing what is going on, eyes and ears. So it's important to know that when a CV comes into me, I can quickly identify if somebody has left something off, off a CV, which I do, I do see that comes in and I can identify and I would know the reasons, um, for, for that. Or if somebody, for instance, has won an award, things like that are all things that I'm able to identify straight away in a CV. Or if somebody is trying to, for instance, somebody has been let go of a job for a reason that, um, well, not a good reason. Um, and I know that information, but they try to tell me something different. Whereas if they go in front of a, a client directly, the client um, will not have that hold of that information. And that is something that I have seen previously before where I have refused to um, take on a candidate and that has the client has gone on and but I wasn't willing to put my name to it because knowing that um, experience and finding the insight um, for the right fit 
to me, hospitality is very much like everything else. Everybody has different personalities, cultures, everybody's different beliefs and what they want to achieve and what their development and opportunities are. So it's vitally important that I work with clients and candidates to identify both to see where things and where candidates want to go. And in terms of, I want to be part of that candidate's career journey and I want to help an employer find the right people and people that will stay and develop within them because that's where I get my buzz from in terms of seeing growth and development um, from within the industry and people who who I have placed. And there's nothing as much as I love as candidates coming back to say how much they've loved to place and it was a great fit. And I think that is crucially important and that is part of the success, um, certainly of daily recruitment. As I said, it's important to look for transferable skills. Um, we are looking personalities. We are looking people that are customer focused, that can deal with um, can deal with customers, and that are very much interactive. Um, anything else can be can be taught. You know, you can teach somebody how how to carry a plate. You can teach teach somebody how to carry a cocktail to the bar, um, but you can't teach somebody um how to in interact with people that's that is in the person themselves whether you're welcome somebody to a tourist attraction whether you're delivering an event whether you are um bringing somebody to their table in a restaurant all those need a people person um as we all know so if you look outside that sector retail has been hit extremely extremely badly um with a number of high streets you only have to look at the high street in the city center itself to see the impact um, but if you look towards those other sectors and even into call centers, there is talent coming from coming from there. People who want to move and want to develop within hospitality and see it as an area and a successful development area. Because the truth is, we it is a very fast growing industry. And when we come out of lockdown, there's going to be so many, many, many opportunities. Um, and people will see hospitality. All of us working together can show that hospitality is a great industry to work in and the career journeys that, that many of us very much have been on over the years. So retaining your team. This is a big one and this is the one question that I get asked all the time. And I have put down my main reasons here in terms of main reasons I get when I speak to candidates and why they're speak, are seeking um, a new opportunity. Many feel respect and value um, that they're undervalued in work. Um, and a simple thank you um, can, can mean so much to somebody in terms of um, in these times for doing something. We also have to be mindful. We are coming back in staff have lost a lot of confidence um, and they're going back in and they are seeing face to face with customers. That confidence has to be rebuilt. Um, and we all have a part to play together, working together to rebuild everybody's confidence within within the industry. So just bear that in mind as people start to come back into work. I mean, they are in work that um, you value the work that they bring to your organization. You value and respect that um, all those little bits help motivate and put people on forward. And now more than ever, I think it's a key thing that we do have to consider, especially, especially with the impact of lockdown has had on mental health. Um, it's a huge consideration that we have to um, take on board. Development, um, been overlooked for internal promotions. Sometimes this does happen and it is a reason why people do leave. It's people have been there years and feel they've been overlooked. Um, my advice there to do is, and this is what I do with my candidates and it, you know, it always has a huge success, um, is to, rather than just say no, look down and think, put a plan in place, look and see how that person, why they weren't the fit, why they, why you think they didn't fit the criteria, have the conversation and look and put down a strategy, put down a plan, how you can maybe get that person to develop into those areas. So show that you're working together. You want that person to develop within your company and put a plan together. Should it be that person needs more um, access to maybe the financial aspects, to move more into management? Well, sit down and, and look at that, include them in those conversations and let them know that you are 
you know, given them the time and the place and you have identified that, but you're also working with them to achieve so that you are growing them into the role and, and where they want to go. Otherwise, they are going to leave and they are going to go to, to, to somewhere else because there's only so many times a person will take um, an internal promotion, a note, an internal promotion before they feel very undervalued. I think also recognising the importance of work-life balance. I think more than ever, as we come out of lockdown, this is this was a problem before COVID, and I certainly think COVID has established it as a bigger one going forward. Um, people want more work-life balance. A lot of has happened over the past year in people's personal lives and work lives, and people have identified now that they want to spend more time um, at work or at home <laughs> at work. Um, so they want to spend more time with their family and they want to utilise. And so it's up to the organisation company to sit down and and to see what pattern works. You know, there is night shifts, there is day shifts and there is weekend. That is hospitality and people need to recognise that and understand that as well. So that is also um, a two way street. But it is important that that is identified and that is balanced out with, with the team as much as possible. Additional unpaid hours. I have had about 100 conversations in the past two weeks in relation to this with um, people from locally, from across Ireland and right into the UK on this. This is now a thing of the past. Um, work at additional unpaid hours will just not be tolerated as we come out of lockdown. Um, people will not stay. This is going to be the number one thing where people are going to leave and People have said it time and time again, and I'm hearing it time and time again from candidates that they are not going to work where they're not going to get paid for for their hours. I think we also have to bear in mind as we come out, we are working as an industry. We have to work together on this and we all have to join together and say, let's start to paint the picture of the wonderful industry that we are, not go back to where we were before COVID of being known for working unpaid hours and everything else and together it takes us all working together to be able to achieve that and to move forward and that is vitally vitally important um it's bad for your brand it's bad, brand bad for your recruitment and it's also um creating a bad reflection onto the industry so together if we move forward it is crucial in that and checking in on your team um, and that brings me back to the respect and value, you know, checking in your team, making sure everyone is OK, as it's especially in these mental health, just to discuss how their development and key areas and areas that you can grow and, and move forward. I follow a couple of these um, companies online, hotel, hospitality online and I love this idea and I think this is a really 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 nice idea you have park 45 park lane you have the Ritz talent and you have hand-picked hotels um that's only three of a variety all have company pages online where they showcase their talent and the staff that they have you were showcasing to potential employees the success and and stories employee stories obviously posting with their consent but i think it is a lovely um showcase and it showcases to the many people who will be looking for roles, why they would choose your company over another company? Why do we want to work for you versus the person next door? Because your company culture, what you do, and the success stories that, um, you know, the internal promotions and things that are all having an impact as, as we move forward. So I would suggest you look at those because I think they're really, really lovely. And I think that they really are a nice asset for, for companies to, to have. I think it's important we all recognise that we all have a role to play to encourage to retain hospitality staff from part time school workers. A first time job has a huge impact. I know many um, hospitality leaders at the moment who came into hospitality when they were 14, 15, worked um, when they were very, very young, went through university, studied, didn't study hospitality, maybe studied something else, but kept in hospitality because they enjoyed it so much as their first job. And I think that is the one thing we all have to bear in mind. That, that is our first that is our first engagement with our industry. We need to keep them and we need to kind of work, create a good environment, let them see it's a wonderful industry. And that in itself will progress and will help us future proof our talent pipeline for going ahead. 
encourage and work with work experience students. Uh, I know in, in times people can get over, things can be busy and things and whatnot, but we have to really encourage um, students that come in. Engage them with teenagers and that will come into your premises, all showcasing what a wonderful industry it is, just chatting to them and it's just putting the um, the thought of working in hospitality on their radar. And the one thing that I will always say, do you ask employees while you're, they're leaving your company? Um, why are they leaving? Do you use this information constructively? Um, even one wee small tweak to that information could change could change um, a lot in terms of you retaining other staff. So the biggest factors contributing to positive interview process include the um, providing 50% say that um, being provided with all 50% being provided with all interview information in advance in terms of job descriptions, all the information on it, it lets people prepare. It gives people that bit of um, information that they need. And I will always do that with my candidates. And if you've been a candidate of mine, you will know that I will always sit down and go through interviews and everything with you. But 50% um, is, is half of the workforce that, that you're trying to gain will be using that and 53 getting feedback from a company and that is a crucial thing so that's also a huge figure in terms of for consideration um when it goes back to showing one of the key points of feedback uh i will say interviews are now a two-way street just because somebody is sitting in front of you does not mean that that person will accept a job it's how you deliver that um interview and it's how you as a um, company business come across to also attract that person so making that person feel comfortable um, give as much detailed information that that you can because information is also there for candidates that if they want it in terms of Glassdoor um, ask an industry representatives you know so it is yours um, the person is in front of you um, for a role and it's up to you to keep that person and attract that person onto your team so the key things will be make the person feel at ease, um, give the interviews a feel for the company and its perks. And when I say perks, I'm not talking we are past now in terms of free company um, lunches or putting in free staff uniform. They're all essential for criteria for work. And to me, that's all part of people want to see more. People want to see the likes of mental health um, and just that work-life balance, being able to work as a team and team days additional or being able to progress or undertake various courses that will help them as well um, as a progress. And also when you have the people on site, give a show round, make them feel, you know, give them a feel for the property, give them a feel for the people. And this will also help to develop a conversation and progress things along. And then it's up to you to offer um, or decline. But re always remember, you want people to work for you. You need people to work for you. And we need to make people feel that this industry is a way forward. And we can only all but do that as a team. So I hope you find that informative. Um, and that's just giving you an outlook from my perspective from, from daily recruitment and working from the industry. Um, you can find my contact details there. We're on tw Twitter, Instagram, and on LinkedIn. Um, and if you have any questions and you want to get in touch, um, please feel free to do so. Hope you enjoyed and look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank you very much indeed, Nicola, for that uh, very passionate, impassioned and driven uh, presentation. You really are uh, right on the money there in terms of what's happening in the sector. We greatly appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today and your willingness to participate in Q&A later on. Just a couple of things which I would draw out of that. Uh, Nicola talked about answering questions. All the panellists are going to be keen to do that. And the polls are up there right now. Hugely helpful for the panel if you're posting a question chat that you just say which part of the the, uh, the business, the sector that you're in so that they can tailor that to you. A couple of points there I thought it was and I wrote it down when Nicola said it, that we approach the next part of the, the business with excitement and fear. Interesting point about everyone being an ambassador. I, I watched with, you know, kind of behind the city on Monday night, Basil Fawlty hosting his Gourmet Night. I think we've all been there and enjoyed that, but been slightly traumatized by it as well. It made me think of a, a, a conversation that I saw a couple of years ago in the Mary Golf Club, a young barman, Andrew, lovely, lovely guy. 
um, chatting to four golfers who were over for the Open. And they had played in Mary that day. And, and Andrew was just, uh, when they were getting, when he was giving them the drinks, telling about other courses that they could play in different tourist attractions. And I thought, well, that is absolutely what Nicola was talking about there, the ambassadorial role of each and every person working in the sector. If I were summing up everything that you were talking about, about the transferable skills, or the human skills, and all of that, the importance of communication. There's a fabulous person in working in film and TV, Mark Zickrey, who works for you know, Paramount, Universal, Sky, all of that. Uh, and he sums all of this up in terms of recruitment is treat people the way you'd like to be treated. And I think that was a very important part of what Nicola had to say to us today. And we certainly enjoyed that. We look forward to hearing a little bit later from you in the Q&A later on today. So thank you very much indeed, Nicola. So when I mentioned earlier on that we were going to be, as well as you having the opportunity to chat and to, to post in the poll, but we're heading to one of the greatest visitor attractions in the world, just a, uh, very, very close to where we are in the great city of Belfast. So head in HR at Titanic Belfast. Uh, Heather is a skilled HR professional working at, who has worked with great success and great achievement in the hospitality and tourism sector. She has vast experience across in-house recruitment, something that Nicola talked about. Training and development, absolutely critical as we move forward. The important area of employee relations, performance management, team building, and policy management. With her thoughts at this very, very special occasion, it's my great pleasure to introduce on behalf of the organizers, the head of HR at Titanic Belfast, Heather Graham. Thank you, Aidan, for that lovely welcome. And thank you to everyone who's been involved in putting this series of webinars together. Um, it's been a really strange time for the industry, but it's great to have a platform such as this to provide support as we now prepare for reopening. As Aidan said, um, my name is Heather Graham and I'm the head of HR at Titanic Belfast. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the business, we are a world leading visitor attraction and we're located on the slipways and the exact spot where RMS Titanic was built. Um, my role at Titanic Belfast covers everything from recruitment right through to when an employee leaves the business. And that includes everything um, like induction and training, um, well-being and performance management. The expertise in our team spans a multitude of specialisms, including visitor experience, retail, hospitality, sales and marketing, finance, facilities, and the list does go on. So it's a challenge for us to attract, recruit and retain across this broad spectrum of roles within our industries. So thinking about attraction and the challenges which we face, um, why do we need to attract people to our industry? Well, the impact of the pandemic has been nothing short of devastating on our industries. No matter what the size of your business, great people are vital to your success. So the challenge of attraction is not just for Titanic Belfast, it is for all businesses in our industry. Pre-pandemic, we had a huge challenge recruiting for Titanic Belfast and in the wider industry because of the significant skills gaps. And this was um, due to the, the growth, which the, the pace of growth in the previous 10 years in our industries. Furthermore, we were also facing the challenge of Brexit and the impact this was having on the migrant workforce, as well as the retention of our teams. We will now have the added challenge of the reputation of our sector post pandemic. Nothing through our, any fault of anybody in the industry, but the stability of it as a career choice because of the significant impact of the pandemic. Businesses such as ours have experienced attrition throughout the last year, compounded in many cases by redundancies, and therefore we will have lost vital skills and experiences as a result of that pandemic. If we can't attract to our businesses, we aren't going to be in a position to grow when we are allowed to reopen and those markets open up again. Thinking of the core challenges which we face in relation to attraction, I want to talk about some of the solutions that we can consider. Titanic Belfast is part of HATS, the Hospitality and Tourism Skills Network. The core purpose of this network is to address talent attraction and retention in tourism and hospitality through collaboration of private businesses and key stakeholders. On an industry level, like Nicola touched upon, collaboration is going to be key to our success moving forward. We're going to need to rebuild this industry together. And the work of HATS is focused on three strands, engage, attract and retain. And these are really pertinent as we move forward. We've had to establish our profile as a best practice employer. Um, and we've done this through sharing our company culture, our ethos and what we do through setting up links with our local schools, 
with colleges, with universities and encouraging those at decision making stage like at GCSE level and before to think of our industry as a viable career opportunity and to encourage them and to start to build that passion for our industry at a very early stage. We've also participated in profile events for the industry, um, events run by the Northern Ireland Hotel Federation, Hospitality Ulster and those to name a few. Organisations such as the Springboard Charity um, are also doing great work in this area in Northern Ireland. They are UK wide and their vision is to future proof the talent pipeline for hospitality and tourism. They've got various initiatives running which employers can get involved in and this is all about attracting young people and building that future talent pipeline. We've worked a group out We've worked alongside um, local councils as well on a number of initiatives and organisations such as Orchardville. And we have been lucky enough to have several of their service users working with us over the past five years. Um, and the diversity and opportunities this has brought to our teams has been brilliant. What I would say is to choose the opportunities which are right for your business. There are lots of opportunities out there, but we all have finite resources and we can't spread ourselves too thin. So think carefully about what you do. So once we've attracted people into our industry and we're thinking about recruitment and that process, which Nicola has touched upon in um, today, um, what does that look like um, actually in the business if you're doing it from an internal perspective? Um, the role you're recruiting for, um, it, you have to think really carefully about that. Um, one of the first managers I ever worked with um, in, in recruitment setting was he told me that um, your problems either start or end at recruitment, i.e. you get it right and it all goes well or you get it wrong and you end up with more problems. And this just isn't in the context of the person you bring into the role, but also the role you're recruiting for. So when you're thinking about uh, any upcoming recruitment you have, try to look at it with fresh eyes. When we have an opportunity, we try to think about the business and what our objectives are. What are the projects we have in the pipeline and what we need from the role we are recruiting for? Particularly relevant in customer facing roles at the moment. If we are recruiting for roles, we also need to be thinking about our customers, their demands and their expectations and how we can meet these um, through the people we have working in our business. Post pandemic and looking forward, we're going to experience a challenging recruitment market. It's going to be very different than pre pandemic and there will be lots of candidates in the market, but their priorities will have changed and we need to overcome any fear they have about working in our industry, given the negative impact which we have ex which that the pandemic has had. We need to be clear with everyone when we're recruiting what the vision is and um, whether we're working with a team in-house or working with an agency partner like Nicola, it means that everyone is pulling in the same direction and working towards the same goal instead of everyone working on their on their own agenda. So thinking about it, not just replacing like for like when you have an opportunity, whether that was pre COVID or post COVID, we've always approached in that manner. The pace of our industries are so fast and nothing stays the same. It's important to always give consideration to what change is necessary. The demographic and demands of our customers will be very different than pre pandemic. And this is also likely to apply to the talent pool from which you will be recruiting. Thinking of this and COVID regulations, what do we need to look for in the people we're recruiting to help deliver this? So probably slightly different approach and slightly different skills you're looking for than you had previously. How you recruit will also look different. Um, next week, we will be doing our first set of interviews in over 12 months. And there's no doubt our world has turned upside down in that time. To have solely done interviews online would have been very unusual in our industry pre-pandemic. We are a people industry. And as a business, we always felt it was important to meet the candidate in person and to give them the opportunity to um, have a feel for our business while they're on site. But now this has changed and we have to change how we approach that process and what we look for through that. How can we see what we need and to see it, but do it in an online way rather than in, per in person if we need to? So approaching your recruitment with an open mind. Um, Nicola touched on this um, in terms of the transferable skills. Look outside the hospitality and tourism industry. Don't necessarily just look for um, someone who has that experience. You're thinking really about the skills and attributes which you want 
to see. And this has been one of the most successful approaches that we've taken to recruitment over the last number of years, particularly in front of house roles, but not just front of house roles. It's really about having the right attitude and approach. Whilst industry experience is vital in some roles, others we have found that successful candidates from outside the industry have brought so much to the business with their transferable skills and prior experience. I'm going to share with you a number of examples today um, where we have experienced this. So one example is um, where we had a concierge who was a retired company director. The conversational skills, the knowledge, the etiquette, the high standards and professionalism which they brought to the role were second to none. Some of those factors were unteachable and they were just in that person um, and they got it from the experience they'd had in previous roles. In finance and procurement, we have people who have worked previously in a manufacturing background. The process, the knowledge and their adherence to standards is so vital. And they have brought this from manufacturing and shared their best practice to improve our business. In visitor experience, we've got some people um, working within our teams who were previous seal, previously sales representatives. The instant ability to strike up a conversation, the natural pattern where they have, which makes them an ideal front of house team member. One of the big changes we had last summer when we reopened was how our retail and our catering outlets operated in visitor attraction. And one of the changes we implemented was to look at the transferable scheme skills between these two teams. Previously they operated completely separately but, but we maximised on the synergies and the cross skills between those two teams to bring them together to provide a better customer experience. High season recruitment, which is our summer recruitment. Previously, we would have recruited as a business overall. The candidates would have indicated their preferences for any of the front of house roles we had, and we would have carried out first interviews in their department of choice. But if that manager felt actually this person would be really great in our business, but I don't think they're just right for my department, we developed a transfer process and they were referred to another department, had a second interview within a few moments. And that meant that person quite often was given an opportunity within the business. Otherwise, we might have lost them if we hadn't looked at it from a business wide approach and not just simply a single role. It's important to remember the intricacies of the industry can be taught. So think about the fit with the culture of your business and how you will assess that in the recruitment process. So we've recruited all these great people. How do we keep them? Um, Nicola shared some of her top reasons um, around retention, and I know Roisin did in the um, webinar last week. There are a multitude of reasons of why employee retention is important. I've picked a few to touch upon today, and um, these are in no particular order. Um, but if, taking the first one, employee morale and satisfaction, this gives us a stable and cohesive team and it can improve your morale and team satisfaction, respect and the value in your team. They are vital to the success of your business. If we're able to retain expertise and talent, the lower the turnover of our teams, it means we can keep that within our business and improve our customer experience. The good staff retention means you do retain that experience. That in turn affects your customer experience. And as you see, as you can now see, all these reasons become interlinked. Naturally, if you have good staff retention, you will have a reduction in time spent recruiting and training, unless of course you're going through some growth. But when you're constantly doing basic training to induct staff because you have a high turnover, this means you don't have the opportunity to, to, to provide development opportunities for your staff who've been there longer term. So if you can retain a team, you have a better opportunity for that, including opportunities to upskill, for example, in management training or perhaps reskill in something technology related. Good staff retention also helps you to build on the strength of your employer brand, which helps you to attract talent, as Nicola touched upon. As you can see, these really are interdependent. In respect of the position we're at at the moment, in terms of the very unique circumstances we have and preparing for um, reopening in terms of COVID-19, there's some really important factors that we're going to be looking at in terms of retaining and re-inducting our teams, which I'm going to share with you. Um, Firstly, um, we've essentially been closed since October. We opened for a couple of days in December, but throughout that period of time, um, everyone has had their challenges. 
whether they've been a key worker throughout, whether they've been in flexi furlough or full furlough, it's not straightforward and it's a lot to process for our individuals. Our work and personal lives have been turned on their heads over the last 13 months and we want to make sure when we bring our teams back this time, we do it and they feel empowered and confident to come back into the workplace. So our priority is to harness the passion our teams have for the business, to focus on their well-being and to remove the fear which they have about returning to work. We're thinking about how we're going to get our key workers back on site, how we're going to get our furloughed employers back, employees back and how we're going to integrate new team members and how we're going to build their strength and protect their resilience over the coming weeks and months. Now that we have an indicative timeline for reopening, we've been putting in place a plan and we're starting to share that plan with our teams. Our reintegration strategy focuses on our teams at a department level, but also um, time for individuals as well. We've got seven core strands. We've got staff communications because as the first point of this, we, we really want to make sure everybody's kept well informed at a business level. Um, we have an internal comm system which we use, but there's other ways around it, telephone calls, um, Zoom meetings, emails to, that people can use to keep their staff up to date. We'll be providing business updates, but also industry updates to really start and um, reignite that passion that people have for our industry and get them excited about coming back to work and what our regrowth might look like. We are go also going to be looking at team charters, and this is to help us get our teams back together in small groups, get them excited, enthused about them returning, and let them agree their team values and how they will support each other during return and reopening. In terms of um, pre-return information, they've been away from the business for a long time. So it's about touching base in terms of um, simple things like have they moved house, um, are there any of their personal details have changed? But also to ask about has anything significant happened in their lives that we aren't aware of as yet? Um, have they had bereavements? Um, has there been anything in terms of family life that they're concerned about? Have they got childcare um, challenges over the next few months? Can we help support that through um, showing some flexible working, coming back part time? Do they, are they ready to come back full time? And also if there's been any medical updates so that we can look at risk assessments um, and also put in place any measures which we might need to. With all of this in mind, it's about providing transparency so that when there are no surprises when they get back into the workplace and the business reopens. We'll also have individual welfare check-ins um, to talk about the um, the pre-return information which they provide. So it'll be an actual conversation with their line manager to follow that up um, with as well. We'll do any risk assessments um, that are needed both on an individual level and a company-wide level relating to COVID-19, but also um, perhaps the medical condition might have been diagnosed when we were closed or someone might be pregnant. So it's just about making sure all those things we would have done as normal when business was operating as normal, that, that we get those things restarted and at the forefront of our mind. We'll also be doing a number of online training sessions with our teams um, to get our mandatory health and safety, our evacuation, our customer service, etc. all back up to date before those doors open, as well as COVID safety and well-being. We're trying to make sure the teams are comfortable and confident in dealing with the challenges which COVID will bring to the business um, and in dealing with um, our customers' expectations to make sure they still have a great experience while they're with us, but we keep everyone safe. And in the final week before we open, we'll have some on-site training and re-familiarisation, get everybody back into the building, let them get a feel for it um, before we open those doors to our customers. As I said, our core purpose with this is to provide reassurance and to make sure our teams feel empowered and supported on their return. It's going to be a big adjustment for everyone. So we will complete all of the above over the next five weeks. And for any new team members, we'll tailor the approach so that they also feel welcomed and informed and confident in starting out in their new role. So once we've gone through this um, process over the next five weeks and once we get reopened, um, there are some things that we'll be looking at in terms of um, retention on an ongoing basis. Um, once we're back in the workplace, we feel it's really important that our line managers to continue to provide emotional support. Um, and I also think it's important as managers to recognise that sometimes you need to seek support if you feel out of your depth with um, a matter which an employee has brought to you. 
If you have an employee assistance programme, refer them there or do seek support from a local charity. There's some great specialist organisations doing amazing work on our doorsteps, so don't be scared to reach out. A big focus in our emotional support will be all about well-being and welfare and helping staff to adjust and ease back into working life. Their priorities will have changed significantly over the last year and we need to work all that out and, and go on that journey together as a team. For many, work-life balance will now be top of their agenda. The last year has given them an opportunity to reevaluate what can we do as a business to support that. What flexibility or reskilling opportunities can we provide? It'll be important for us to be open to change once we're re once the business is reopened based on the feedback of our teams. We've had operational changes. We've had to put in place changes to make sure the business is COVID secure. We need to make sure our employees' voices are heard, to listen to them and to take on board any changes or suggestions they have. And if we can't adjust, adopt the change they've suggested, then explain and consider alternatives. This helps um, support your employee satisfaction and improve staff retention. Our budgets will be massively stretched, but there are some great funded training opportunities available to support with development. Um, Hats of a Skills Funding Guide, which is signposted to all those support options. There's also apprenticeship opportunities and the local colleges can support via skills focus for short, sharp, focused training. Also look at development opportunities with no cost. Like for example, if you're working on a special project, can you get somebody who has expressed a desire to develop involved in that project so that you can um, expand their knowledge and expertise and help them get them ready for the next step? So finally, um, in terms of retention, you know your business and you know your people better than anybody will. Um, what works in our business not might not work in yours and what works in one department in our business might not work in another. But over the last year, we've learned to adapt and show flexibility that we never even thought was possible. And for us, it's going to be really important that we harness those lessons learned and retain that in our business. So we support the rebuilding of our business and support our vitally important team. It'll be important to celebrate our people. They are vital to our recovery. Again, budgets won't be big, but it doesn't have to be. Remember, a thank you goes a long way. A coffee, a cake treat on their birthday or giving them a little flexibility. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we'll just finish up to wish everybody best wishes for a successful reopening. Thank you so much, Heather, uh, for, for your presentation today. And I think you could certainly do with one of those uh, Titanic afternoon teas, perhaps with a little liquid refreshment to, to uh, soothe your, your tonsils there. Thank you so much. Just a quick summation. I think what Heather was talking about there was the collaboration. Not only collaboration is the key to success, but communication as well. I love the piece about thinking about the needs, not only of the business, but of staff and of clients. Uh, as well. And I read a, an interview with Prince Charles recently where he talked about those two words, thank you, acknowledging someone and recognising their importance uh, as being critical to the success of any business. That's something that Nicola was talking about earlier on as well when she talked about everyone being an ambassador. I've compared a number of events in Titanic Belfast and your staff are so helpful and so welcoming uh, and, and it's great to, great to be there. And you talked about your concierge. I just looked up there when you were talking, Heather, a review on TripAdvisor. And it says, uh, an American visitor said, when visiting Titanic Belfast, find Jackie, the head concierge. He is amazingly helpful. Well, certainly in my experience of visiting Titanic Belfast, all of your staff are amazingly helpful. And we're very, very grateful to you for that. Just one thing that seared into my memory was being in, in Titanic Belfast for an event one day. Uh, that I was comparing and I met one of our former students uh, who was working there and he was saying that a, a cruise liner with 3,000 people had arrived into Belfast that day and almost half of them had visited Titanic Belfast. That, as you will know, Heather, that football, that football, that spend, that contribution to the economy. Gosh, we're so looking forward to being able to do that again. Thank you so much, Heather. And we Thank look forward you. to hearing from you a little bit later on today. Well, we talked about it, both Nicola and Heather have talked about the importance that education plays in this and providing training, which is absolutely bespoke and absolutely relevant to the needs, not only of the learner, but of the employer as well. And someone who's uniquely placed to uh, share her experience and expertise is my colleague, Carla McNeese, who is foundation, who coordinators, uh, coordinates and is the director of the Foundation Degree in Hospitality and Tourism Management 
at Belfast Met. Carla. Thank you, Aidan, and thanks again to Nicola and to Heather for their presentations as well. So I just want to take a little time, I won't keep you long, but it's just really to tell you what we do at Belfast Met and all the other six colleges across Northern Ireland um, to help industry and to support them in their needs and what they have. Um, we do want you to get in touch with us and um, to maybe join our industry board where we have advice from industry and what they want the course content to be and then we try and write the course um, to meet the needs of industry and obviously our awarding body Ulster University. So across the six colleges there is um, a so much experience and knowledge over the years. Most of the lecturers will have industry experience as well, uh, which is very useful. So just to let you know a little bit about our courses and what we do. One of the main things uh, that we do to prepare our students for industry is looking at employability skills and getting the students to be prepared. So we will give them interview skills and give them mock interviews. Um, we get them to research jobs within their chosen industry, be it hospitality, travel and tourism, or events and uh, they look at jobs, they look at the job descriptions and they look at the skills that are required, the essential skills and desirable skills and so they have to carry out a skills audit on themselves, what skills they already have and what they need, prepare an action plan and then do a career pathway to where they want to be in five years. So they're really thinking through how their career can progress. Um, we also get them to do CPD logs and it's really making them aware of how they can develop their skills and make them stand out against other people. So we encourage them to participate in web webinars, you know, industry webinars and see how industry talk to each other. We also encourage them to do online training and um, Google Digital Garage and things like that, which really will improve their skills. So that's what we do with um, all the other colleges do this as well as we move on. So facilitating industry in recruiting staff. Um, we can do that in different ways and if you are a large organisation and maybe doing group recruitment for seasonal jobs or one-off group recruitment, whatever the case may be, we can help you out. And just to give you an example of some of the organisations that have come through um, and carried out group recruitment, um, Stena Line uh, actually got a bus and took all the students out to the ferry and took them around the different departments within the ferry um, to actually see what each job was. So it wasn't just one job on the ferry. Um, and then at the end of that, they had an application process for the students who were interested to apply and get a job. And that was a seasonal job, but then some of them were offered to stay on. We've done something similar with Swissport at the airport. They have come into the college and spoke to whoever, any amount of students that wants to come along and hear the talk. And it's very good because they're pointing out, you know, it may look very glamorous, but you could be starting at half four in the morning and you could be doing split shifts and so on. So they very clearly lay out the disadvantages of the job or the less attractive parts of it. And again, at the end, if you're still interested, come along and apply. So they have been very successful in the past. Um, obviously that didn't happen this year, um, but it's very good. And as Nicola mentioned earlier about a show round, uh, they get a chance to actually feel for the job and see what it's about. Um, and just to let you know, we have a cohort of students in hospitality events and travel and tourism who are finishing in May, around the middle of May, and they, um, will be all looking for employment. So if you have anything, if you're looking for people, please feel free to contact us. Uh, the details will be available for all six colleges at the end. So whichever one you think may be more relevant, you can contact them and see if we have any students looking for positions. The other thing I would say is I keep in touch as do all the other lecturers with past students through social media mainly. Um, so if I see a job coming through on LinkedIn or Facebook or even Instagram, uh, I tend to share that. So I know that all those students are going to see it and I would encourage them to connect with me in social media for that purpose. So again, we can do that. Or if you let us know, we can share that ourselves on our site. So uh, that's another support mechanism, hopefully that will be attractive to you. Um, just to let you know how we're preparing our students for going out into industry, we take them on um, 
trips to organisations and let them see what goes on there. So it gives them a feel of what actually happens uh, within the job. Sometimes we will go to, for instance, Crumlin Road Jail there, and uh, we were able to speak to some of the employees, the tour guides and so on, and get a feel of what their job involved. We also attract guest speakers from industry and Nicola has very kindly done that in the past and talked to us about the whole recruitment procedure and given us interview tips and things like that. So that's been great. Uh, we've also had Invest NI in, um, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right there, where they come and encourage students um, on entrepreneurship and the different programs that are that can support them should they decide to open a business themselves. Um, yesterday we ran a virtual conference. Now this was something that the event students had to do as part of their assessment. So they organized a virtual conference and we had various speakers um, who told them about their roles now and from the start from when they were students so that the students could relate to it with Neil Dalzell from ND Events. We had Michael Stewart who is president of Belfast Chamber of Trade and Commerce. We had an ex-student Hannah Kane from EasyJet. We had another ex-student Nicole McKeown, one of your colleagues Heather. Uh, we had Richard McGowan who actually they're actively trying to recruit students for apprenticeship programs they're doing because they've expanded so much. So that was a great opportunity for him. And uh, we had Sandra and Scott from Oasis Travel talking about the role as a travel agent. So we do try and run these things on a regular basis. Uh, we have career supports throughout the college as well who run events. Um, so it's, you know, very useful and hopefully would help you out if you're interested in something like that. But it also helps the students understand the industry that they're going into. And just a little bit um, to say as well, you know, it's not just about written assessments and exams. And I know when I've gone into industry, people have said, you know, but we want them to understand the operational side of things. So we do try and incorporate practical assessments, um, giving them hand on experience and nearly getting them ready to hit the ground running, so to speak, whenever they start to work. Um, just an example there, uh, the event students organised a fashion show in the Europa Hotel. They had to go and do that all themselves. And they raised over £14 for the Alzheimer's charity. We also do things for our level three students. There's a career ready program and um, they have they are assigned a mentor from industry. Uh, they have to be interviewed for it and they have like an eight week placement, which is really an excellent experience for that age group, which you're talking about students that leave with GCSEs and come to us. There's also the Inspire program. We were approached by Belfast City Airport um, to discuss, you know, whether it would benefit the students. And that was hugely successful. The students um, across Northern Ireland from other colleges, they all went together and they should have been going to LA last June. But unfortunately, COVID hit and that didn't happen. Um, but it's just to let you know that they are a selection of things. And if you ever wanted to approach us about any initiatives you were thinking of, we would be happy to work with you, any of the colleges we'd be happy to work with you. So um, just to mention then the work-based learning, um, some of you may already be aware of this. These um, are just some of the organisations who have supported us or are currently supporting us in providing the students with placements. Um, the placements start the end of January until the end of May. Um, they can be voluntary up to three days per week during that period. Uh, the students have to do a CPD log and they have to do a research project. And the research project really could be something that would be mutually beneficial to the student, obviously for their assessment, but then also to the organization. Maybe your manpower, you don't have someone to assign to um, carry out market research. They would do that and put it in a report and give you their findings. So it can be very useful that way as well. Um, and just really, it gives you an opportunity to see, are they a fit for the organization? Not only um, do they have the right skills or the right attitude or so on, but even are they a fit with the rest of the staff, which can be very, very important. So it's an opportunity there for you to get the students in um, and see if that works. Now, these are foundation degree students. They've done their A-levels and they've done a year and a half at college. Uh, doing level four and level five modules at the end of this, then they can go on and do the honours degree. Some of them actually get kept on in their placement. Um, and we also have had students who have got kept on over the summer. And then while they go and do their honours degree at Ulster University, uh, they can work part time in that placement. So all of that has worked out really well. And I would say it's great 
great to see. Um, I attend the Northern Ireland Travel News Awards every year, and it's great to see the success and the ex-students who are now winning awards, managing an organisation or whatever. Um, and we do encourage the students to go forward for competitions. All the colleges do, and they all compete against each other for things like the IFEX and the Institute of Hospitality um, Student of the Year, and also the Northern Ireland Travel News Student of the Year. So it's great. It gives them. Um, a little bit to work towards as well and it's something that stands out in their CV and I hope that organisations recognise this and that they're a little bit maybe more passionate than the rest. So um, it was just to give you a real sort of um, update on what we do in a college. We're here to support you. Um, as I say, there's six organisations across Northern Ireland, uh, or six colleges, sorry, that are willing to help. So these are all the contact details here. Um, if you have, if I have said anything that you're interested in, please feel free to contact any of us, and we will get back to you. And that's all. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, there's an opportunity soon. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for that presentation. So much information and lovely to hear about the great work being done in the six further and higher education colleges right across Northern Ireland. Carolyn mentioned project based learning, which is so important for all of the colleges whereby students are doing real live projects with proper deadlines, working in partnership with industry. And we like to think that gets them ready, as Carolyn said, to hit the ground running and go into your business. What a lovely thing, Carolyn, your students did in organising that fashion show uh, for the Alzheimer's Society and raising £1,400 for such a worthy cause. It really is wonderful. And we thank you uh, and all of your colleagues across the six colleges for doing that great work. Well, uh, a number of uh, questions are in the chat and we will have uh, information uh, has been posted, a video, and uh, lots of links to the different funding streams which are available as well. And so many interesting questions where your uh, participation in the poll has been very greatly appreciated by all of the organizers. But a couple of questions have come up here. And Mark Rice uh, echoed the point uh, which Heather was, was saying about how lovely it is to look after staff and their mental health and well-being and make them feel valued terribly terribly important in every industry as you know uh, marianne hood points out as i think as all of the three speakers talked about the challenges and all of these rules are difficult to recruit for and challenging that's something uh, which in our first presentation nicholas certainly didn't shirk and heather was very aware uh, very, very aware of that as well. A question that I'm going to direct to, to you first, Heather, and then to Charlotte, and then to Carolyn, comes in from Charlotte Gibson. Uh, and we're talking about retaining staff and supporting staff post-COVID. But I suppose just to strike to the kernel of this, and we'll start uh, with you, Heather, if that's okay. How would you, because you're on the cusp of interviewing lots and lots of people, how have you identified, targeted is the wrong word perhaps, but how have you identified staff from other sectors, encourage them to come and work for you at Titanic? I think one of the things we do, um, which probably the majority of employers do now, is the, that we advertise through online channels, which um, automatically increases your reach because we've all come across people from um, various walks of lives. So especially th um, through channels such as LinkedIn, you never quite know who picks that up. So we're encouraged to share that. But if, for example, we had a role in facilities, we would look at um, where facilities rules are typically advertised and not necessarily just our online channels. We might go to their professional press um, or if you had an HR role, you might look at advertising through people management, CIPD, or you might go to a specialist agency if you were looking for a specific set of skills. So it's about taking a tailored approach for us to each role that you're looking for um, and about trying to get the message shared as wide and far as you can because you never quite know who will pick that up. And, and, and that's really useful sometimes as well. Absolutely, to spread it wide and far and promptly, because time, as Nicola pointed out, is of the essence. Yeah. Because we're all we're all competing for the same talent pool. Nicola, I wonder if you might address that and think about that. If there's any in particular, from, certainly from my perspective, um, I get a lot of um, clients who would go directly to the market and then would come to myself. And what I've seen more and more, and a number one question that I get from my clients is, "Well, why didn't that person come?" To, Tech, why didn't that person apply to me directly? And I think um, recruitment and hospitality using agencies is pretty much a new thing in hospitality. And I have witnessed over the past number of years is people who have said to me before would never use an agency have, have moved forward and have seen the advantage to having that, that I have that reach that a, a normal job description or as a post on LinkedIn um, mightn't have. It's because I can 
people now like to have that third person in between so that I can they can be behind a smoke screen I'm asking all the questions getting all the answers for them and then bringing it back and that is something that is a number one question that I get from my clients is how, why are they not to plan directly and that is because people like to have yeah. that buffer in the middle yeah absolutely and and it's all about communication it's all about I mean you talked about being being live 24 7 being at events looking at things and not really switching off and that that's going to be absolutely yeah. critical moving ahead Carolyn would you pick up that point because you talked about using online platforms to communicate opportunities to former students anything that you would add to what both Heather and Nicola have said at this point sorry Carolyn I think your your microphone may be muted Carolyn something that I I did three times today already, so I, I empathize with you. <laughs> okay. No, it's just really to say we would be very careful when we are recruiting students to make sure that the industry is right for them. Um, as Michael mm -hmm. Stewart said yesterday, if it's not in your DNA to work in an industry like this, do not apply. Um, the same really is uh, applies to our courses. Um, so we do like a pre-entry guidance where we talk about the course and what it's about and the type of jobs within the industry. Um, we do try and uh, have transferable skills. For instance, one of my students this year uh, did very well in marketing and felt that he wanted to go more into that area. So he's now actually working in a marketing department for a tourism organization on his placement. So uh, we do try and encourage um, our courses, our foundation degrees, our management courses. So there are the generic modules that can carry them yeah. to other industries if they decide it's not for them. And it, it's an interesting point you made there about, about Michael Stewart talking about whether it was in the DNA. You know, we have a former journalism student at Belfast met, Kitty Andrews, doing wonderful things at UTV and, and, and doing great stuff as a producer presenter. But we got her in to talk to our journalism students and she said, yes, it is glamorous to be a TV presenter and it is it is wonderful. But when I do it, when I do Good Morning Britain, I'm in studio at half past four in the morning and I'm helping the producer out and there's nobody there to stir my coffee and steam my dress. I do it myself. Yeah. Uh, and she was really laying it on the line there. It's about that communication. I wonder, Carolyn, could you address a point from Ruth? Because she, Ruth is talking about uh, opportunities for 18 to 24 year olds and can students be recruited from that? Pool? Would that be something that you could comment on? Yeah. Um, the, the 18 to yeah, we certainly can. The foundation degree is for students at 18 or older um, who have finished their A-levels. Uh, you must have A-levels yeah. and GCSE maths and English in order to get onto the course. So, um, yes, definitely they can be recruited. Um, and we do have, sometimes we have mature students who have actually retired. We run a tour guiding course and there's a lot of people who have retired and actually joined up for that course and absolutely loving it and doing extremely well from it. So um, yes, but 18 to 24 year olds, absolutely. Um, mainly the foundation degree, as long as you have the qualifications, but we do have other courses that you can do if you didn't have the qualifications and needed to upskill in something for a year or two and then move on to the foundation degree. But um, as I say, our contact details are there if you wanted something more specific. Um, there are some programs, I think, for the 18 to 24 year olds as well that were um, mentioned in last week's seminar, so our webinar. Um, so it might be worth looking at those or contacting me and I can point you in the right direction, Ruth. Uh, and the lovely thing about this is that all of the all of the webinars are up there for for people to look at. And it was an interesting point that Heather made about appointing a, a company director to that concierge. What a what a wonderful use of a lifetime experience. And I uh, visited the Grand Opera House a few years ago and and was shown to my seat and given some very interesting information about the Matcham Theatre by a retired headmaster. So you know, and and he and his pride is supposed to think that he'd seen Miss Saigon eight times without oh. pay. You know, so there are perks. Uh, there are perks for that as well. So we're really, really grateful to everybody for contributing to the um, the polls and to the um, web chat today. Ruth and Heather, anything that you would like to add, just to, just in in concluding this, because all of the, the the great information will be uploaded. But maybe a final word from you, ladies. I just think that it's very much. Uh, thank you to everybody and wishing everybody. The very best of luck and that we all do have to be mindful that we do 
are coming out together. We are, as I call it, one big hospitality family and wishing everybody the best of luck. And if I can help across the way, please don't hesitate to to reach out. The phone, as it says, has been ringing the past couple of days with new rules coming in, which we got up on the website. So um, give me time to get those done and daily recruitment will be, will be working to get the industry open as best as we can. Thank you. Well, one of the things is about looking after your staff and their well-being. You look after yourself as a business owner. That twenty-four-seven, you got to take a break at some time. And it's great hospitality. Anybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very grateful to you because it's going to take every single one of us, including leaders like you, Heather. Would you like to close for us today with any of your thoughts, please? Yeah, just to share um, and to echo what Nicola said, really, just to wish everyone all the very best over the next few weeks. It's exciting and a little bit daunting for everyone. Um, but hopefully this is the last time we're going to have to reopen and that we can rebuild and grow. But we will only do that together as an industry um, and we will have to work together. And it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, so there's lots of fun ahead and lots of hard work, I think. Lots of hard work, lots of wonderful contributions uh, from you uh, as leaders, both in education and the sector. We're very grateful to you. We thank the organisers. We thank everyone at the six colleges who has made this possible. We thank everyone for joining us today. We hope you find it to be very useful indeed. And don't forget to visit the website to review and evaluate everything which you've heard today. Thank you for stopping by. We'll see you again next week when Siobhan Mulvena will talk about some of the wonderful opportunities which are available for employers, uh, specifically in the area of recruitment. Thank you for joining us and have a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you.